Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Rebecca Franco and I'm the president of the Women Law Students Association here at the University of Georgia School of Law. I'd like to thank each of you for coming to the annual Edith House Lecture. It's nice to see such a good turnout and I'm sure you won't be disappointed. This is Wilsa's 24th year of hosting the lecture, which brings outstanding female legal scholars and practitioners to Athens, Georgia from all over the world. I'd like to recognize and thank Dean White. She's the J. Alton Hosh Professor of Law and also the very first woman dean in the law school's 145 year history. Also, J. Thank you. Please. Also, J. Alton Hosh Professor of Law and Associate Dean Paul Kurtz. We've been lucky enough to have the support of Dean Kurtz at the law school since 1975, and he's served as the Associate Dean since 1991. In addition, I'd like to thank and recognize Werner F. Chafe and Distinguished Professor of Fiduciary Law, Professor Sarah Jane Love. Professor Love has served as Wilson's faculty advisor forever, and I'd like to thank her for her help and support. And most importantly, I'd like to turn the program over to the brains and the bronze behind this wonderful program, the woman who actually coordinated all the events, got everything in order, the first Vice President of Wilson, Lindsay Willis. Good afternoon. Our audience is assembled here today to hear an accomplished woman speak under the auspices of the Edith House Lecture Program. It is also a time when we pause for a moment to reflect upon the life and career of the woman in whose honor this lecture series is named. Ms. Edith House was a serene and cheerful individual. She never dwelled upon herself and was genuinely surprised that anyone would want to write an article about her, much less go so far as to name a lecture series after her. <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. You ready? Okay. She even blushed about the school's attention on her as the first woman to graduate and reminded everyone that she and Gussie Brooks graduated together and B comes before H. Ms. Brooks practiced less than a year and engaged in a satisfying lifelong career as a homemaker, so she asked the school to focus its attention on her good friend, Edith House, who earned highest honors as co-valedictorian of the class. I have never figured that I accomplished anything extraordinary, Ms. House once said. It didn't occur to her that she was ahead of her time, a pathblazer in an era when single career women had few doors open to them in the traditionally male-dominated field that was the legal profession in 1925. Yet she had no stories to tell of struggle for survival or acceptance. Instead, she thought that it was an embarrassment of riches to have three job offers upon graduation and have to turn two of them down. She accepted a position with a law firm in Clearwater, Florida, where the land boom was on and earned a princely salary of $175 a month. Four years later, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Florida persuaded her to join the legal staff as Assistant U.S. Attorney, and she had found her niche. During the course of the next 34 years, she handled everything from condemnation work and counterfeiting to moonshining and drug violations. When the district was subdivided in 1963, Ms. House was appointed acting U.S. Attorney until the position was permanently filled through a presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. No doubt the position could have been hers, but she decided to retire at that point. Her cancer had been diagnosed and she was ready to step aside and do some private practice for a change. Her attention turned to assisting family members in legal matters related to business and estate planning, and she never did open her general practice door nor collect a fee. Somehow, it just wasn't in her nature to do so. She enjoyed helping others without compensation. Her classmates in law school, her associates in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and her family members attest to the generosity of her spirit, and the law school has been the beneficiary of her annual alumni gifts throughout many years. She gave sustaining support to the lecture series in its early years, and she provided for it in her bequest. 
The women of national renown who come to the campus to give lectures under the auspices of the Edith House Lecture Endowment are pathfinders in the law, and they provide role models for law students in their career choices, just as Ms. House did. Her life and career exemplified the abundant talent that women bring into the legal profession today. It is my hope that we share in her sense of contentment as she told those around her that she lived life abundantly and with no regrets. And it is now with great pleasure that I introduce another accomplished woman among us at the University of Georgia School of Law, Ms. Erica Hashimoto, Assistant Professor of Law. Professor Hashimoto earned a bachelor's degree with honors from Harvard University and a law degree magna cum laude from Georgetown University Law Center. At Georgetown, she was inducted into the Order of the Quoth and served on the Georgetown Journal of Legal Ethics. After law school, Professor Hashimoto clerked for Judge Paul L. Friedman of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia and then for Judge David S. Tuttle of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. She developed a practical understanding of criminal law while serving for four years as an assistant federal public defender in the office of the federal public defender in Washington, D.C. In this position, she gained significant trial experience representing clients charged with a variety of federal crimes. Professor Hashimoto joined the University of Georgia School of Law faculty in the fall of 2004 as an assistant professor teaching criminal law, evidence, and sentencing. Please join me in welcoming Professor Erica Hashimoto. Thank you, and thank you everybody for being here today. Um, progress in the area of women's rights in this country over the past 50 years can be attributed in large part to the effort of women lawyers who not only were on the front lines in the battle to advance women's rights, but also served and continue to serve as role models for the, their younger counterparts. Today's speaker, Dr. Sarah Weddington, is an example of such a lawyer. From the beginning, it was apparent that Dr. Weddington was driven both to be a role model and to promote women's rights. She started early, graduating from college at the age of 19, and then going on to graduate from the University of Texas School of Law at the ripe old age of 21. Of course, most of you probably know that she successfully argued Roe versus Wade before the Supreme Court. 26 years old at the time, she is believed to be the youngest woman to win a case before the Supreme Court. At the same time she was litigating Roe, however, she also was starting a legislative career. She and several women friends in Texas had tried to lobby the Texas legislature to change laws they believed were harmful to women, including the rape laws which required victims to prove their chastity and to resist to the maximum extent possible, and laws criminalizing abortion. Ignored by the legislators, this group decided to take matters into their own hands and to run a woman candidate, Sarah Weddington. In 1972, using a straight grassroots approach, and fueled by comments from her opponent referring to her as that sweet little girl, <laughs> Dr. Weddington won the Democratic primary. In November 1972, approximately four months before Roe was decided, Dr. Weddington won the election to the St Texas State Legislature, and in 1973, the same year Roe versus Wade was decided, she was sworn in as a Texas State Legislator. She was re-elected for two more terms and served in the legislature advancing issues of importance to women until she was appointed by President Carter as the general counsel for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She was the first woman to ever hold that position. One year later, she became a special assistant to President Jimmy Carter, a position in which she continued to work to enhance the quality of life and equality for women. I could go on for a long time, as you can probably tell, about Dr. Weddington's accomplishments. But I will conclude by saying that, as is apparent, Dr. Weddington's life represents the constant struggle to promote women's equality and to break down the barriers that have prevented women from advancing. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Sarah Weddington.
Now, I was not introduced, and it was a lovely introduction. I'm so glad you didn't introduce me as being historic. Um, I have been introduced that way. And sometimes I feel historic, but I certainly don't think of myself as being only a part of history. But three years ago, I had a call from Time Magazine. Time Magazine said, we're going to be 80 years old, and we're going to do a special issue of Time called 80 Days That Changed the World. It's our 80th um, anniversary, and we have chosen 80 days. One of those is 1973, and your trial of Roe versus Wade, would you write the piece? Well, of course I would. Um, I want to do more writing. It was a great magazine, um, wonderful opportunity. So they said you get 1,500 words. I started trying to write 1,500 perfect words that would be read around the world. And they called back and they said, well, we think the war is going to start. We're going to have to cut all the articles to 1,000 words. Now, harder than writing 1,500 perfect words is cutting it to 1,000. But I got to work on it. And they called back and they said, the war is going to start. 300 words is all we can spare. <laughs> so 300 words it was. Here is the cover magazine for the March 21st, 2000. Well, this is the picture from March 21st, 2003. And as you can see, the war was starting. Here is the inside cover of what was supposed to be the outside cover, 80 Days That Changed the World. And here is my 300 words, right back, kind of on the bottom, right there. Um, but you know, I've always heard a picture is worth a thousand words. And not long before this article was due, I had been on an airplane. And the flight attendant kept looking at a button I was wearing. It was a button some of you will remember from the time before Roe versus Wade. It was a coat hanger in the middle with a slash across a red circle around it. And for us that meant no more back alley abortions, no illegal abortion, abortion should be safe and legal. And she would look at that button and she would go on down the aisle and come back and she would look at it again and she would go on and come back and finally she stopped and she said, what do you have against coat hangers? <laughs> but it reminded me history is often very important. Of those 80 days that time felt had changed the world, there were some of them that had both a man and a woman involved. For example, some of you may remember when Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs played tennis. But of the 80 days, if I tried to count, which of course I did, how many women are featured, there were 10. Don't have time to tell you all of them because my plan is that I'm going to speak until 4.30. I am then going to pause and open for questions, and we'll stay to answer questions, uh, any questions you might have. So if I look at who were those 10 women, here's some of them. 1951 was the first showing of I Love Lucy. And the article says it was partially because women had never been known for humor, and she was. And then with her husband, um, they knew to keep the syndication rights, and so they became very wealthy. 1955, Rosa Parks. And of course, with her recent passing, we all have been very much thoughtful of Rosa Parks. And in fact, there's been a little quip in Washington that said, we honor Rosa Parks before, because she refused to give up her seat for a man. I wish Sandra Day O'Connor could have done the same. <laughs> Nineteen fifty nine, Mary Lakey and the Origins of the Human Species, May nineteen sixty, the pill, Margaret Sanger, September nineteen sixty two, Rachel Carson, the environmental movement, Silent Springs, nineteen seventy three, Roe versus Wade, my role in it, nineteen seventy seven, Star Wars with Carrie Fisher. <laughs> 
Now, I had to ask my students about that one, and they said, Sarah, she was the first intergalactic princess. <laughs> well, we are not going to limit ourselves to the U.S. It's on to the galaxy. But it is certainly Women's History Month, and so it's a time for us to look back in history at some of the people who really did make a difference and to think about things that still need to be done. While not everyone who has an important role in history is a lawyer, I do think that the abilities and the skills that you learn in law school give you a critical advantage in the kinds of skills that are needed for leadership. I do think that some leaders are born women. It's just that we need to help women develop their skills of leadership. In fact, my secret goal, which isn't so secret because I'm telling you, um, is that when they do 100 days that change the world, that there would be a bigger percentage of women who have key roles. And I do think that's possible. I brought only one exhibit I wanted to use because some of you perhaps will think of a judicial career. This is a clipping from the Chicago Tribune on August the 7th, 2005. It is a picture representation of every person who has been on the U.S. Supreme Court. And as you might guess, those who are in black robes with white faces are white men who have served on the U.S. Supreme Court. If you look at red robes, those are women who have served on the Supreme Court. And if you look at blue robes, those are minority men. So if you just keep, you have to keep going to see any of the red or uh, the blue robes, but here is one, here's a red, here's a blue, here's a red. And that's the sum total of women who have served, and minority male, who have served on the U.S. Supreme Court. So I hope as years go by, some of you in this audience might become one of those featured persons' leadership. If I think of, you know, my frustration is, how do I try to tell you in 30 minutes something that would cause you to decide to be a leader and to use your legal skills to that end. What I'd like to do is start talking from a personal perspective a little bit about how I got into leadership, what pluses and minuses that has been for me, and then for just a moment some of the problems I see of the future. You see, if anybody had come to the University of Texas Law School looked around at a group at the students in 1967 and said, which one of these students will try an important U.S. Supreme Court case? They would not have picked me. Um, I had come there, one of five women in the 1965 entering class at the University of Texas Law School. I had worked my way through law school doing a number of things. I was the medical records librarian for Holy Cross Hospital. Loved the, you know, getting to go, because I could talk them into letting me go watch surgery since I was going to be typing it up and needed to see what was happening. Uh, I typed the papers for other law students because I was such a good typist and I could correct them as I was typing. Um, but I really was not somebody that you would have thought of as being a trial lawyer necessarily. In fact, when I finished law school that year, I could not get a job. Now, I know a lot of you, especially 3Ls, are already so worried about what is going to happen to you. And I understand that exactly, because I was going through that, you know, try, uh, trying to get interviews, trying to figure out a job, all that stuff. And the truth is, at our university in 1967, the firms would pay for men to go interview, but they would not pay for women to go interview. And a woman, and there are a lot of women that I'm going to call unsung heroines, because they're women that you may never know their name, but their impact has been huge for certain individuals. And our placement director was named Mettie Brown. 
Betty Brown decided it was wrong for firms to come to the University of Texas and interview students, but not what pay for either men or women's way to go and interview. So she made a rule that firms could not come to the University of Texas Law School and interview unless they would pay both for men and for women to go interview. So I was the first woman from the University of Texas Law School to have her way paid to interview. That was exciting. They paid for me to fly from Austin to Dallas. Uh, 187 miles, but it was the principle of it. And then I spent all day with a senior partner who said things, because I was the first woman that ever had to interview, um, and so he would say things like, really, to train a young lawyer, we have to be able to cuss them out. We can't cuss you, you're a woman. Or things like, um, to real, I mean, women have to be home to cook dinner. Lawyers have to work late. How could you do both? And other major objections. Um, and so I did not get the job. I talked to my male law school colleagues who did get the jobs and said, you know, they said, the firm said I was very good, very bright. They were sure I'd be a good lawyer. But they just hadn't had a woman, and that was uncomfortable. They could take women as paralegals. They could take women as secretaries. But a professional woman. That was just too much at the moment. Now, I've got to come uh, ahead 13 years real quick. 13 years later, the senior partner of that law firm wanted to be a federal judge. There were three people who had to sign off on nominations to go to President Carter. <laughs> the Attorney General of the United States, the Congressional Liaison, and me. Now, truthfully, I would not have kept him from the appointment simply because of my history and what I knew about the firm. But I did go back and check their hiring practices. Hadn't changed a lot. And then he made a fatal mistake. If I had been a male, he would have called and said, I hear you're holding up my nomination. I need to just come talk to you. Can we work this out? Is there a way for you to clear it? He didn't do that because I was a woman. So he sent a male lawyer, a friend of mine, a friend of his, to tell me that I had to approve him. Guess the moment I decided he was not going to get approved. <laughs> In fact, my mother always said, you should be nice to everyone you meet. You never know where you'll see them again. And his mother should have told him that. <laughs> but I look back at all those times, times when I played half-court basketball because women weren't allowed to run full court. Times when after two dribbles, it was called traveling, a technical violation. And so we would go dribble, dribble, pass the ball, dribble, dribble, pass the ball, dribble, dribble, pass the ball to the center court, pass it to the other half, two dribbles. How many of you played half court? I can see from your nods. There's one in the back. There's several up here. Um, I went a couple of years ago to the women's final four in New Orleans. And the University of Connecticut was in it. They had a woman who was so tall and stately and good. And then LSU had a little bitty woman. She went under everybody to make her <laughs> baskets. So good. And I thought, if anybody said to those women, you can't keep running, you have to stop, they would run right over them. But that never occurred to me. And so our, we were so limited in what we were really able to do. I, thought in high school, in college, that my goal was to make eighth graders love Beowulf. I tried teaching eighth graders to love Beowulf, and that's when I decided I really should go to graduate school. <laughs> Went to the dean of the college and said, I think I want to go to law school, and he said, you can't. And I said, why not? I have very good grades. And he said, no woman from this little 1,700 student population, Methodist-affiliated college in Abilene, Texas, has ever gone to law school. It would be too tough. You know the moment I decided I was <laughs> going to law school, and in fact did. I got out of law school and ended up working for the city attorney's office in Fort Worth, Texas. It was just before I had finished law school and just before I went to work in Fort Worth, I had been helping my evidence professor who had stopped class one day and asked if I would come and visit with him after class. And you know when a professor asks you to come visit after class and you think, oh my God, what did I do, what, et cetera. But what he wanted was for me to work for him for a number of months to redo the canons of ethics or the code of professional responsibility now for lawyers. So I was working for him when a group of women came and asked if I would help them. And when I asked what, by the way, my 
office at the law school was in Boys Town because, as the dean would know, all the new um, professors were men. And so that was the floor they were housed on. It was called Boys Town. Um, that wouldn't be true anymore. Uh, but I was working for him. A group of women came, said, can you help us? What do you need? And they said, we've gathered information about how to prevent pregnancy, but sometimes people say, I'm already pregnant, I want an abortion, where could I go? And their question was, we have gathered information about these things, could we give it to people? Could we tell the newspaper? Could we tell the radio station? Or would we be prosecuted as accomplices to abortion? I didn't know the answer to that question, but I knew what to say. And that was, I don't know, I'll go to the library and look it up. And that's what I did. Use the very same skills that you use now, only you have internet. And so you probably find it faster than I did. But I found cases from the past, you know, Griswold versus Connecticut. You remember Connecticut had a statute that said if you use birth control, you are a criminal. And a woman named Estelle Griswold had given a contraceptive device with her Dr. Lee Buxton to a couple, married couple. They were arrested, prosecuted, and convicted of being an accomplice to the use of a contraceptive device. <laughs> and that case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court in 1965 said there is a right of privacy that includes whether to bear or begat a child. I began to do other research and finally said to them, well, we can file a lawsuit. Now, if they had come to me and said, would you mind filing a US Supreme Court case? I would have thought, no way. At that point, I had done not one contested case. I had done uncontested divorces, wills for people with no money, and one adoption for my uncle. <laughs> that was my complete legal experience. But I thought that we could file a lawsuit and we would help get some other case up to the U.S. Supreme Court because there were cases being filed all over the country in various states. Now, when I wrote a book called A Question of Choice, I went back and I said to them, why did you come to me? And they said, Sarah, one, we wanted a woman lawyer and you were the only one we'd ever heard of. And second, we needed somebody who'd do it for free. <laughs> That's how I got the case. But I look back on those days now. I, I will never forget getting ready to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. You know how you are the night before a major exam. And you go to bed and you think, what if they ask such and such? And you get up and you check it and you go back to bed. And then you think, what if they ask such and such? And you check it and you go back to bed. And the night before oral argument, I could not go to sleep because I kept thinking about what if they asked such and such and I would check my notes, be sure I had it and go back to bed and I would get up and go back to bed. Uh, by the way, I wanted to be sure there was nothing they could ask me I wouldn't know. Rehnquist asked one question I did not know. Here was the question. When was Texas readmitted to the union? <laughs> Never occurred to me I needed to know that for Roe versus Wade. But I knew what to say, and that was, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't know. I'll go home and look it up and send it in on a supplemental brief. It's not in the opinion, as you all know, because I'm sure you've read it. So I don't know why he asked it. Some people said they thought he was trying to throw me because I was a young lawyer and he wanted me to lose. Others, anyway, you know how we all theorize about what it might have been. But then I went over to the court. You've all seen those white marble steps that lead up to that platform marble columns that reach into the sky. You go through the doors of the U.S. Supreme Court, down a corridor that's about as big as these two center sections. Marble busts of former chief justices and niches as you pass, they seem to look at you. And you go in the back of the U.S. Supreme Court chamber, which is about the size of this room, holds 300 people. When you come in at the back, there are very heavy red velvet curtains. Uh, as you go through, what you see are what look like three sections of church pews with fancy padding. The section to the left is the tourist section. So every three minutes while you're doing oral argument, a group comes in, a group goes out, a group comes in, a group goes out. First come, first serve, you get to sit in those two other sections. 
Then there's a gold railing that separates the layman from the lawyers. And when you all finish and you want to be admitted to Supreme Court practice, if it continues as it is now, you can ask a member of the Supreme Court bar to introduce you in open court for admission. It's usually you have to have about three people say if you're of good character. In my day, it was pay $25. I don't know what it is now. But you could either do it by mail to be admitted, or you could go, and the first thing when the court came into session was the Chief Justice would recognize the admitted member of the Supreme Court, and that admitted member would uh, present the person who was there to be admitted, and you get to say, thank you, Your Honor, or something equivalent to that. But the nice thing is, ever after that, you can always say, you know, I remember the day when I appeared before the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> And then, there you are, lawyers. Two tables for those who will be arguing the cases. My case was going to be first case to be heard, so I was first table to the left. When it was time for the court to start, I looked to my left, and there were 100 members of the press waiting to see what would happen. As I looked to my right, it was the Attorney General of Texas and those of his entourage. And just beyond that was the section for family and friends of the justices, absolutely packed. When it's time for the court to come in, the marshal comes out, cutaway tails and striped pants, and says in essence, oh yay, oh yay, oh yay, all ye please rise and face the court. There is a hush. Everyone stands. Curtains behind the bench part. Judges are silhouetted in their black robes, and they start marching in. I had a friend who said there was organ music playing in the vestibule. <laughs> that was not true. And by the way, did you see in the New York Times yesterday, there's a thing they may not allow uh, organ pipes to be manufactured anymore because they have some lead content. Uh, for, so anyway, there's an article about it, something I'd never thought about. Uh, and then the judges put their papers down and Justice Berger, Chief Justice of the time, said, Miss Weddington, if you're ready, you may begin. Now, when I finished, you know, 30 minutes per side, one hour per case, I had to go outside and ask people what I had said. <laughs> I was so involved in it. And then later, went back and ran for the legislature because I thought if I lose the Supreme Court case, I want to be in the legislature. I could try to change it from there. And so I had just been elected to the Texas House and on January 22nd was at the Capitol. A reporter from the New York Times called and said, does Miss Weddington have a comment today about Roe versus Wade? And my assistant said, should she? <laughs> and the reporter said, it was decided today. And my assistant said, how was it decided? <laughs> and the reporter said she won it, seven to two. Now, looking back, it makes me think about how long ago it's been, more than 33 years. Because at that point, FedEx had been incorporated, but you couldn't send anything FedEx yet. Um, the Texas Capitol did not have a single fax machine. If I think about how you get news, you get it over the internet. We didn't have internet. I couldn't go to LexisNexis. And so in some ways I've reminded of how long ago it is. Now if you come to my office, I do have my goose quill pens, white goose quill pens. It's a souvenir that when you argue in the Supreme Court, when you take your place, there's a white handmade goose quill pen and it's for you to take as a souvenir for having argued in the U.S. Supreme Court. If you come to my office, I have my photograph. Well, it's actually a copy of the opinion. I'm not sure whether you can see this, but it's just a copy of the opinion and each of the judges signed it. And then if you win a case, you can send in by, from the Supreme Court, a picture of the justices and ask them to sign it for you. So I have an autographed photograph of all of the justices of 1973. And sometimes people will say, well, can you get one of those if you lose? And I say, I don't know. I've never lost in the Supreme <laughs> Court.
But if you had told me then, I would still be talking about it today. I would never have believed it. In fact, in the legislature, we went on and did lots of good things. Uh, for example, great lawyer story. Uh, we were trying to change it because, um, as you know from the introduction, your professor, uh, Texas had a law that said that you could not prosecute rape unless you could prove the woman or the victim uh, had resisted to the maximum extent possible. And the police would say, don't resist, you'll get hurt. But our law required that for prosecution to be successful. And so we were trying to change that. In fact, it was Kay Bailey Hutchison, who was in law school with me, as now a U.S. Senator from Texas and I, who were carrying that bill. And we were in this hearing, and the head of the committee, uh, a man, uh, but not the best one, um, he kept saying, oh, I've tried these cases, and I know women that women lie. They'll say whatever they have to say and all that stuff. And one of our witnesses was a woman lawyer named Gretchen Rotz. And Gretchen, it was her time to testify, and she said, Mr. Chairman, I have represented thousands of these women, and I'll tell you of the heartache. I'll tell you of the misery. I'll tell you of how so many who deserve to win don't. And when we got outside, I said, Gretchen, I didn't know you tried a bunch of cases like that. And she said, well, I hadn't, but he hadn't either. Uh, <laughs> and sure enough, we got our bill passed. Equal credit, a lot of things. And then I got a call asking if I would come and work for President Carter. Best job I've ever had. Um, you know, just weekends at Camp David, having an office in the White House above the Oval Office, um, flying Air Force One, dinner with Margaret Thatcher when she was in town, <laughs> You know the little things that make a job interesting. <laughs> it was a great opportunity. And I like the saying about Jimmy Carter that says, Jimmy Carter is a president who used the presidency as a stepping stone to doing more important things. And in fact, he has done so many really important things. I look back and I didn't have to be a lawyer to do all the things I've done. But the skills of a lawyer were, truthfully, the wind beneath my wings. So that I look back, and when I was running for the legislature, I didn't have to be a lawyer. But there were so often people who were lawyers who had been elected that law became a um, rite of passage almost for people in political office. They could discuss with more rationality. They could understand the system in a better way. And because I was a lawyer, it made it easier for me to run for office. In the legislature, I didn't have to be a lawyer, but I'd had all the classes you're taking. And so I knew how to write a bill. I knew how to read a bill. I knew how to propose legislation. I didn't have to be a lawyer by legal requirement, but it was tradition that lawyers were picked to be general counsel of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And that was the job I had when I left Texas. And I certainly didn't have to be a lawyer to go to the White House. But again, I was doing briefing sessions on legislation. Uh, Hosni Mubarak, who is now the head of Egypt, was then vice president and was one of the people I used often for briefings on the Camp David Accord. It was a time when I had an opportunity to help suggest people for top federal appointments and certainly for judicial appointments. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of the people that we got uh, nominated and confirmed to the D.C. Circuit, which put her in a position later to be su considered for the U.S. Supreme Court. When I left the White House, and you know every life has ups and downs, and there were so many ups of being part of the White House, we would come to work, and on the left was a picture gallery, and it would be the, the president with the U.S. hockey team when they beat the Russians. It would be the president with the president of Egypt, the prime minister of Israel, when we signed the Camp David Accords, whatever was big, and you'd come to work and feel so good. And then we lost the election of 1980, and the next morning we came to work, and we were all tired and dejected, Everybody I knew, including me, had just lost their job. There were no pictures in that gallery. Instead, there was an article posted that was entitled, 50 Things You Can Make for Christmas for Less Than Five Dollars. 
It was appropriate. <laughs> but I ended up teaching law at the University of New Mexico, being an assistant to Jim Wolfenson, who has more recently been head of the World Bank, and using law again in so many different ways, including starting my own private practice. I look back, and when I was sitting in law school, I could not in any way have seen the path where law would take me. But it is those skills that you are learning every day of writing, of argumentation, of preparation, the knowledge of how to help people, finding within your own hearts issues that you really care about and you want something to do, to make an impact. There are lots of definitions of leadership but I want to give you mine. My definition is that a leader is someone who has learned how to and who has the willingness to leave their thumbprint. Some of you will end up in major private practice, but I hope as you do that, that you will also volunteer some time on boards of volunteer organizations or nonprofits. Some of you will make far more money than I ever have, and I hope you will contribute part of it to things you care about. Some of you, in fact, will be elected to public office, and I hope while you're there you will not forget those who really need justice on all kinds of issues. Some of you will use that law degree to help you in doing many other things. But I look at you and think of you as the future of leadership in this state and others. Three quick tips that I have used so often. One, I believe that leadership is based on practice. And so it's not that you have to be perfect to be a leader or a lawyer, but you certainly can, through practice, learn skills and attributes and talents that will help you in that. Now, my practice was in really traditional ways. I came from that era when women were pretty traditional. So in college, for example, no, excuse me, before college, I was the president of the Future Homemakers of America <laughs> of Canyon High School. But I learned how to be a president. Uh, I was the drum major for the Canyon Junior High Band. In law school, I was the secretary, well, first in college, I was the secretary of the student government. You know, at that point, I didn't know any women who'd been presidents or vice presidents. Now, that's not to say we weren't trying to figure out how to make things happen, because I was the secretary, my boyfriend was the vice president, and my roommate's boyfriend was the president. So we could pretty much run things as we were uh, right there in that little suite. Um, but I was the secretary. I went to law school. I was the secretary of student government. But what I was doing was practicing leadership. So as other opportunities came along, I could take advantage. And so whether it's the Women's Law Student Association, whether it's um, student government, whether it's other things you have a chance to do, you don't have to be perfect. Just start practicing. I thought about that principle when I left the White House and I went skiing. Now, I went to New Mexico. I had never skied. There are a lot of stories about Texans who try to ski. Uh, but I went up, took lessons. And you know how they have you come down and you have to twist and, you know, put your shoulder down, turn it around, you know, all that stuff. Anyway, and then they set me up on the baby slope. And it took me all afternoon to come down. But I finally came down, said to the instructor a little bit proudly, I have come all the way down and I did not fall once. And he said to me, then you're never going to be any good. Because he said, the only people who are ever good are the ones who will go a little faster than they know how to control, but who, if they fall down, have learned how to get up. I'm not trying to get you to do what I saw some on the slopes doing, and that's coming off the top of a hill yelling, help, I can't ski, and just going right down. <laughs> but I am urging you to try some things you're not sure you can do. Practice leadership. Second, I think there are a lot of things you can learn by what I call the use of the critical eye. I don't mean to just be critical, but I do mean to watch other leaders and learn from the best of what they do and learn to avoid what doesn't seem right to you. 
I learned human relations skills from a lawyer named Ed Wright of Little Rock, Arkansas. Ed was the president of the American Bar Association when I was first active, and he was the best. I wish I could have seen him in a trial. I know he must have been fantastic. But I would come up, I was the young lawyer who was working for this group, all men, former Supreme Court Justice, uh, Smythe Gambrell, who started Eastern Airlines, which doesn't even exist anymore. His heart would be broken. Uh, but a lot of men who were really important. And I would come up and feel a little awkward, to tell you the truth. And Ed Wright would turn around and he said, Now, Sarah, you haven't tried a case like this, but you will. And just saying my name made me feel so included. And I learned by watching Ed Wright a lot about good techniques of human relations. I learned part of my speech skills from watching other people. Albert Sabin, who did the Sabin polio vaccine, was on a panel with me on medical legal issues. And I had written out my entire speech because I wanted to be perfect. And afterwards he said to me, Sarah, a speech read is like a kiss over the telephone. It may mean the same, but it sure doesn't feel it. And I learned not to read a speech, to have it outlined and organized, but don't read a speech. Or I am one of those people that traditionally when I was speaking, if I was coming toward the end of the time I was allotted, I would start to speed up to be sure I could get everything in. There are six more issues of leadership I've got to be able to quickly mention to you. I want to mention to you. And I would just go, you know, 100 miles an hour. And then I watched Barbara Jordan, first black woman elected from the South after Reconstruction. And if she were doing the ending of a speech, it would be like this. The Constitution, the Constitution is a document, a document that guarantees equality, equality, equality. And I learned from watching Barbara Jordan to slow down, not to speed up, and to emphasize the key points. I watched other speakers who could use humor, and I thought they were better than I. In fact, my administrative assistant in the legislature was a woman named Ann Richards. Uh, I've always said you should get the best volunteers you can. You never know where they might go. But one time, Molly Ivins, uh, who's also a friend, said to uh, Ann Richards, is it true Sarah has no sense of humor? And Ann said, no, it's just you have to say to her, Sarah, this is a joke. That was pretty true. But I got to watching other people who used humor well, and I wanted to learn how to do that. One of those stories, or one of the keys I learned, was if you mention a name that you associate with humor, you are more apt to laugh, like when George Burns turned 100. But at 96, he said, I can do anything today I did when I was 18. And then he said, it just goes to show how pathetic I was when I was 18. <laughs> or not long ago, a few years ago now, uh, Jimmy Carter invited me to his 75th birthday uh, party. And I was really looking forward to it because the MC was going to be Kirk Douglas. I've always thought Kirk Douglas was cute. Uh, and you know, he's got that little dimple and all that. And so I got to meet, and I'd taken my camera, because I was going to have my picture with Kirk Douglas. And I did take my camera. I did not have a picture taken. Kirk Douglas is this high. <laughs> and I would not have a photograph that would show I was larger than Spartacus. <laughs> the use of the critical eye to learn from other people things that you want to pattern after and things that you want to avoid. And last, it is looking for those issues that you want to respond to. Did you all see the movie Lord of the Rings? It may not have come to Athens. I don't see any heads. <laughs> OK, did any of you see Lord of the Rings? Oh, good. <laughs> It's going to ruin my story if you haven't seen it. Um, and you know, the second one is The Two Towers. And there's a scene in this movie where the good people of the town have retreated to a keep, a defensive structure. And the orcs, 
the evil ones are coming at them in overwhelming numbers. I mean, when the orcs move, the whole earth shakes. The sun has been blotted out by the um, uh, smoke from their weapons. They are overwhelming superiority. And they're coming at them. They have come through the outer walls of the defenses. They are slaughtering the people who are defending in that space between the outer walls and the inner walls. The king has retreated further in. The people have retreated further in. I'm one of those people I get so involved in movies. And so I'm thinking, how? What is going to happen? They're all going to be wiped out. There's just no way any. I, I was frantic. And then on the third day, on the top of a hill, reinforcements appeared. And the day was saved. It's one of the reasons I love going to law schools. Because I look up. I look out, and I see what I think of as reinforcements. People who will have the skills, people who will have the talents, people who will have the knowledge of how to work within our legal system, and who can, in a very genuine way, leave their thumbprints. Certainly there has been discrimination that has affected both men and women. I've got two quick stories I want to tell you. Uh, one is, I was once doing a speech for President Carter, and it was talking to a group of business leaders about how we needed to use the best talents in America for all kinds of things. And afterwards, a man came up to me. He was a little red in the face and apoplectic, and he had this form, and he was shaking it at me. And I looked at it. It was a form from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And on it, he had circled in red, and then he had used yellow marks a lot and all that. And on it, he had uh, noticed a certain line. And he said to me, look at this form. This is how ridiculous the federal government can be. I looked at the form. It was from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And the line he had circled read, list all of your employees broken down by sex. Right under it, he had written, none. Our problem is alcohol. I use that when I think of drafting and doing it accurately. <laughs> or discrimination involving men. Some of you will remember when Southwest Airlines started. A lawyer uh, from San Antonio started Southwest Airlines, or was co-partner. Herb Kelleher, good friend. Herb decided that he was going to you know, try to get business going real fast, and he would call it the Love Airline. I don't know if you've ever noticed the swizzle sticks have hearts on the end of them. Uh, the peanuts are called love bites or love bits. Um, when he first started, all the flight attendants and all the people who worked the counter were women, and they all wore short shorts and knee-high white go-go boots laced up. And a young man decided he wanted to be a Southwest Airlines flight attendant. And the lawyer for the company answered, that people would not want to look at men in short shorts and white lace-up knee-high go-go boots. And the young man said, well, he hoped they would change the uniform. Uh, and then he held a press conference after he filed a lawsuit, and he unfurled escape chutes, he made coffee, he fluffed pillows, he did what the job required. And eventually, uh, it was ruled that denying him the job was sex discrimination. Uh, the company had also maintained that no young man could be a flight attendant because men didn't know anything about love. Uh, and it was the love airline. Um, but they did a survey of passengers who said they were not flying looking for love. They were looking for cheap fares and on-time arrivals. Um, and so that young man won. Uh, there are a number of others I could say, but discrimination hasn't been just in one direction. One of the things I'd like to see is for us to erase discrimination. But I want us to do it in a positive way. I want us to look for ways to work within law, to see that times are changed. There's an old Indira Gandhi saying that says, I have felt like a bird born in too small a cage. And I think many people can relate to that. And so I hope that you will continue part of that process I've been involved in of trying to push back barriers and give people a wider area within which to live their own lives. I have been so uh, honored to be a lawyer 
and honored to have used the talents of a lawyer to leave my thumbprint. Thank you.